My name is Calvin Rushing. I'm a fellowship trained podiatric surgeon at Dallas Orthopedic and Shoulder Institute uh, down in my home state of Texas. I would like to take this time to thank Pod Med Adventures uh, for the invitation and opportunity to present some of the research that I completed last year during my fellowship at the Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Center in Worthington, Ohio, alongside two of my mentors, Dr. Heyer and Dr. Burlett. Uh, the title of this research is Risk Factors for Early Failure of Fourth Generation Total Ankle Arthroplasty Prostheses. So when we begin to talk about total ankle replacement, we've seen a number of two component fourth generation arthroplasty prostheses be introduced to the United States market as the popular indications for total ankle arthroplasty have continued to expand. Principles of fourth generation two component prostheses include minimal bone resection, peg or barrel fixation to the distal tibia without stems, and anatomic contour that parallels the native tailor articular geometry. Now survivorship of these newer prostheses range from 92 to 97% in five years, with better improvements in function and higher patient court and outcome measures compared to ankles treated with arthrodesis. Given these promising results, it is plausible that perhaps one day, one or some of these prostheses might fully devolve the role of ankle arthrodesis in the treatment of end-stage ankle arthritis. However, as with any innovation or technology, it remains important to discern which factors are truly predictive of success or failure, and few studies uh, in published literature have actually assessed outcomes for this most recent generation of prostheses to enter onto the United States market. So the purpose of this study was to identify independent risk factors for the early failure of fourth generation total ankle arthroplasty prostheses using baseline patient demographics, characteristics, operative factors, and a surrogate for bone mineral density, uh, the distal tibial cortical bone thickness. Uh, so for the methods, there is a total of 97 ankles that underwent arthroplasty with a fourth gen prosthesis, either the infinity or cadence between August of 2015 and June of 2018 at a single institution with at least six months post-operative follow-up and the mean of 18.3 months. Primary outcome for this study was a need for revision defined as removal of one or both metal components for any reason excluding infection. Secondary outcomes included an assessment of complications as defined by Glazebrook and reoperations as defined by Vander. Baseline patient demographics, like I mentioned, characteristics, radiographic alignment parameters, and distal tibial cortical bone thickness were also assessed. For the radiographic parameters on the left, we assessed the coronal deformity using the tibial Taylor angle, and for the sagittal uh, Taylor displacement, we used the tibial axis Taylor ratio, which you can see there on the right. For the assessment of the cortical bone thickness, which again, as I mentioned earlier, acts as a surrogate uh, for bone mineral density as shown by Patterson et al. in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery back in 2016, with values of less than 3.5 millimeters correlating with thanks to T-scores indicative of osteoporosis, uh, we performed measurements uh, which in short uh, consisted of uh, the longitudinal axis of the tibia, of the ankle being bisected with lines drawn at 30 and 50 millimeters from the distal tibial joint, joint line respectively. At each level, the entire width of the tibia was measured, uh, M1 at 30 millimeters, M3 at 50 millimeters, followed by measurement of just the medullary canal, M2 at 30 millimeters, and M4 at 50 millimeters respectively. CBT was defined as the average value between the measurement difference at each level, M1 minus M2 at 30 millimeters and M3 minus M4 at 50 millimeters, and thresholds of less than or equal to 3.5, 4, and 4.5 were defined for the analysis. Magnification was, of course, standardized. The initial post-operative AP weight-bearing radiographs taken at six weeks were reassessed for alignment, uh, again using the tibial Taylor angle as well as the tibial uh, coronal component deviation. The post-operative tibial Taylor angle is defined as the angle between the longitudinal axis of the tibia and a line perpendicular to the Taylor prosthesis, which you can see down at the bottom left, E, where the coronal tibial component alignment was defined as the angle between the longitudinal axis of the tibia and a perpendicular line to the component, which you can see in the upper uh, left-hand picture labeled as A. Post-operative lateral weight-bearing radiographs were used to assess five parameters. The sagittal tibial component alignment, which was defined as the angle between the longitudinal axis of the tibia and a line perpendicular to the component. 
uh, which you can see labeled as B. We also looked at the posterior under and overhang in millimeters, labeled D in the upper right hand corner. And we also reassessed sagittal Taylor displacement using the tibial uh, axis Taylor ratio, as well as the Taylor component uh, inclination also known as the gamma angle or dorsiflexion angle of the talus, which you can see in the bottom right, labeled as F. Finally, we graded the uh, first post-operative weight-bearing radiographs at six weeks for periprosthetic lucencies using the grid previously established by Cody et al. Now, overall, for the results, we had a total of 97 fourth generation prostheses that met the inclusion criteria, 65 infinity, uh, less than five of which were actually flat top tailless, uh, most were the chamber cuts, uh, and 32, which were the cadence prostheses. You know, overall, survivorship for the study was 97% in an average of 18.3 months. Uh, looking at this results table, uh, there's a lot of data. Uh, one thing that I kind of want you to uh, pay attention to is the cortical bone thickness. Now, out of the patients that we had, we were unable to get cortical bone thickness measurements on about 16 of them due to post-traumatic changes or hardware, which made it difficult to discern uh, clearly the delineation between the cortical bone and the medullary canal of the tibia at those levels of 30 and 50 millimeters, respectively. Still, of the measurements we were able to perform, the average CBT uh, was about uh, five, just over five millimeters and we only had five ankles that actually had a CBT of less than or equal to four millimeters. Uh, this kind of coincides with literature that has shown using Hounsfield's units that typically, as we know, ankle arthritis is usually post-traumatic in most cases and the Hounsfield units have actually suggested uh, increased bone density uh, of the tibia and talus in those cases. Uh, so again, we did have only five cases that had CBTs of less than or equal to four. You know, this was significant uh, because three of those five uh, ankles actually went on to have aseptic loosening, uh, one infinity and two cadence. The aseptic loosening occurred on the tibial side in two components, one due to a post-operative periprosthetic fracture of the medial malleolus. The other one occurred to gradual cystic changes. Uh, the final case of aseptic loosening occurred on the Taylor side, actually, of a cadence prosthesis. And again, that patient uh, actually had some uh, history of previous subtalar joint fusion attempts with two or three non-unions. Uh, so you could theorize that perhaps the vascular supply of the tailors was compromised, uh, providing suboptimal support from the get-go uh, for support of that prosthesis. Um, the takeaway from that long-winded explanation on the previous slide of that table uh, is that a reduced cortical bone thickness of uh, less than or equal to four millimeters uh, in our study did trend towards uh, early revision, although we could not conduct all the statistical testing uh, and hypothesis testing was also precluded due to the few number of actual failures, uh, but it also was associated with uh, early reoperation and trended towards complications as did diabetes and hindfoot fusion in accordance with previous total ankle arthroplasty studies. And the significance of this is that uh, this study is the first to suggest a potential relationship between reduced bone mineral density of the distal tibia as measured uh, by the surrogate distal tibial cortical bone thickness and early revision, reoperation, and complication and minimal resection prostheses without stems, particularly referring to fourth generation uh, total arthroplasty prostheses. The clinical relevance suggested by this study, if you take on nothing else, is number one, bone density in total ankle arthroplasty appears to matter, and two, a simple and quick measurement method determined using weight-bearing AP ankle radiographs may allow us as surgeons to preoperatively discern our patients that are at higher risk for total ankle arthroplasty failure. Thank you.